Well, thank you once again for joining us, and welcome to Grace. Uh, we're going to return in our lesson today, as I told you folks earlier, uh, with our journey through the Bible, and we'll do so by giving a, looking at, taking a quick glance, let's put it that way, back at what we've discovered thus far in our studies. So this will be a review of sorts. We know that a great change of economy took place, God dealing differently with men, when God ceased dealing with Israel on a national level and in accordance with a law contract under, uh, under which he had placed that nation. And he began dealing with all people alike, Jews and Gentiles alike, according to what the Apostle Paul calls the exceeding riches of God's grace. So it's a different economy. It's no longer the law program. It's now a grace program. That great change of economy, translated by the word dispensation in your Bible, um, took place with the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And Paul's subsequent conversion while on that road to Damascus after having voted for Stephen's stoning. We read about that in Acts chapter 9. So God began dealing differently with mankind. But don't make the mistake of thinking that just because uh, God's program with Israel from a national standpoint has been placed on the shelf, placed on hold in a manner of speaking, for a period of time undisclosed, that God's through with the nation Israel. Because we know the precise opposite is true. God is going to come back and re uh, restore that program, restore his promises to Israel, and he's going to give them every promise that he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob concerning their physical blessings and their place here on this planet and that land that he gave them. Don't, also don't make the mistake of thinking he started to gear up that program by bringing Israel back into the land today. The Israel that he's brought into the land today, and he hasn't brought them in, they've just gone in, um, are in unbelief. And when God brings them in, according to Scripture, when he gathers them, it'll be his return to the earth. And they'll be in belief when they go into that land. And he'll be with them. They'll be with their king. So um, God has not, not done away with his plan and promises to, the, to Israel as a nation. Uh, he prom that nation he promised to make of Abram, that's sitting off in the future while he deals with all individuals alike in this economy, this dispensation, according to his grace. Um, a believing nation Israel, as I said, in time future, will indeed become the recipients of all the promises God had made to the forefathers of that nation long ago. However, with the stoning of Stephen, as we talked about just a moment ago, uh, those promises were placed on hold. And as we said, a great change took place as God appointed a new apostle, uh, the Apostle Paul, to be the spokesman concerning this new economy, this new dispensation uh, that's now in place. A uh, verse often overlooked by theologians and preachers is the statement made by the Apostle of Grace in Romans chapter 11, it's verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the Apostle of the Gentiles, not of one of the twelve to make thirteen. He is the sole Apostle, Paul is, that God appointed uh, over the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. Paul never magnified himself. We shouldn't magnify Paul. We magnify, who do we magnify? Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ didn't quit ministering uh, when he ministered to Israel on the earth concerning their program and their promises. He died, was buried, rose again, uh, and ascended into the heavenly realm, and he continued preaching, but now he was preaching through Paul to the Gentiles. So there's a change in economy. And Paul received numerous revelations, so many that uh, he had to be given that thorn in the flesh to keep him from becoming so prideful in, in the multitude of revelations that he says he was being given. God committed to the Apostle Paul the responsibility to reveal the details of these revelations and to reveal them to all men, to Jews and Gentiles alike. How would Paul fulfill his God-given role? That's a pretty good question. Well, the answer is this. He would undertake three different, what I like to call, apostolic missions or apostolic journeys. He'd take three major journeys before his trip to Rome, where he was imprisoned, of course. And that, those three journeys would span the course of some 30-plus years of his ministry as the Apostle of Grace. It's the letters Paul wrote during the course of those journeys that form the order, or we might say the sequence, in which God wanted the truths he committed to Paul set forth or laid down we might say. Notice for instance how that took place. Paul's first epistle was written shortly after the conclusion of his first apostolic mission. It was his letter to the converts in Galatia, his very first letter. And that came at the conclusion of that first journey uh, to Asia Minor when he was in the territory of Galatia. Um, it was his letter to the converts there in Galatia who had begun to revert back to the notion 
that their righteous standing with God was based upon their performance in accordance with the law of Moses. They were reverting back to the law for righteousness before God. Remember, some had come from James, told them that they couldn't be saved unless they were circumcised. And absolutely, circumcision was a requirement in that law program. So they were going back to the law for their righteousness. And for that reason, Paul's very first epistle was an epistle concerning the issue of faith. As you can see there, I've, I've added that to our little chart. It was the issue of justification that comes by way of belief rather than behavior. Justification or a perfectly righteous standing before God that comes uh, through the issue of, of faith. Uh, it, it's, it's faith, not man's performance. This is the reason for Paul's statement in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, where Paul said, knowing, not wondering, not suggesting, not hoping, but knowing that a man is not justified, not given a gift decree of righteousness, not declared to be righteous by that man's works of the law. It's not our performance at all. But by the faith, now look at this word of, not our faith in him, but by the faith that belongs to Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall how many be justified? No flesh shall be justified by law keeping. So it's Christ's faithfulness, and in order to have eternal life, we have to be identified with the faithfulness that belongs to our Savior. And that comes when we believe, when we accept what God says to be true about what His Son accomplished at Calvary when He came to take away sins by the sacrifice of Himself. So it's no longer a sin issue for anyone, believer or non-believer. It's a belief issue today. Will we believe what Christ accomplished when He died for our sins at Calvary? As you recall, the, the people in the assemblies in Galatia were being told, as I said earlier, that they had to be circumcised uh, if they hoped to be saved. Paul had to address that notion, uh, which is what he was doing in Galatians chapter 3, verse 2, where he wrote, This only what I learn of you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? Did you receive the Spirit because your performance was such that God decided you were worthy of it? Or by the hearing of faith? So it was, it's always been faith. It was obviously a faith issue in Galatia. And this was the very first doctrinal issue that God knew the Apostle Paul would be facing, thus faith became the foundational issue, we might say, uh, of which God knew his Apostle of Grace would be writing. His first epistle was Galatians. So we're not looking at those epistles uh, in the order they appear in our Bible. We're looking at them in the order in which Paul wrote them, which it's an interesting thing. Nothing has changed, if you think about it. When you look at what was happening in Galatia, nothing has changed in the more than 2,000 years that have come and gone since that first epistle from Paul was written and delivered. Most in the religious world today continue to tie a person's proverbial ticket to heaven, if not their fellowship, as they call it, to a person's behavior rather than to that person's belief. Uh, what was the next doctrinal issue Paul would be, have to address? Well, all we need to do to find the answer is to look at the assembly to which Paul would write his next two letters after Galatia, after Galatians. He wrote them during his second apostolic mission, and he sent them from Corinth to the troubled saints in Thessalonica, which you can see up there, it's circled in red on this new little chart. Uh, we know them as First and Second Thessalonians. Next two letters from Paul. Can anyone recall the issue when it came to the troubled saints at Thessalonica? Remember, Paul described them as being shaken in mind. They were troubled and shaken in mind. It was the issue of the believer's hope. It wasn't faith in this case, it was hope. Uh, we spent some time discussing that hope in a, in a previous session. Of course, after Paul's second journey, where hope was the issue, came a third journey during which Paul would write his next two letters uh, to the saints at Corinth. It was in his first letter to Corinth that Paul wrote this inter interesting statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. He mentions three things. I'm sure you'll recall what they were, but Paul mentions three things that remain in this dispensation of grace. Uh, let's take a quick look. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. And now... Now, that's an interesting statement. And now, that's a direct reference to the change in the economy, the change in the dispensation that took place with Paul's conversion. And now, abide of three things. What are they? Faith, hope, and what comes next? Charity. Now, charity is the word the translators chose when it came to translating the Greek word agape. Agape, the verb agapao. Agape, an action word. It's not a feeling word at all. 
Uh, when we think of love, we think of emotion, we think of feeling, and that's because the, all the other types of love have emotion or feeling tied to them, but not agape. Agape is an action word. Agape is a choice. Agape is a decision we make, and it's a, a word describing a particular type of love. It's action love based on the fact of benefiting the other person. It's a selfless type love, and, it, and it's an action word. As I said, it, it's doing something to benefit the other person. Uh, these three things remain, faith, hope, and agape love. But the greatest of these is agape, translated again, charity. Let's take a closer look at this third journey from Paul and the, and the Corinthian saints here. As some of you may recall, Paul had reached what might be called the turnaround point. He had come all the way up through Asia Minor. He had gone, got the Macedonian call. He went into Macedonia, down to Thessalonica, down to Corinth. And now he's in Corinth again. Let's take a look at this. He arrived at that metropolis. He spent 18 months teaching uh, in that really uh, commercial metropolis while on his second excursion. Uh, so he knew, he had already known this assembly when he arrived there on his third trip. He knew all about these people. He knew that of all the assemblies that he had established, the saints in Corinth were the most carnally minded bunch he had ever encountered. They epitomized the title of a book and a song in our day, and you'll probably recognize it, called Looking Out for... Number one, that was the saints in Corinth. Carnal, as you know, and Paul car called them babies. They were saved. They were saved and sealed saints. But they were carnal. They were fleshly oriented. They were bent on serving themselves, bent on serving the lust of their flesh, uh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Um, it was all about serving self in Corinth. It was never about the other person. Uh, many Bible teachers have said that the professing church today is more like that Corinthian assembly than any of the other assemblies to which Paul wrote. Who could disagree with that? Um, I found myself jumping on board and saying, yeah, I think that's probably true. Sex, sexual sin was prevalent in Corinth. Sexual sin is prevalent now. People were dividing into factions or sex, sex into small groups, uh, holding themselves out to be better than others in the assembly. Is any of that taking place in our day? Uh, what's any different? Believers were going to court against believers. Uh, does that sound like something that's beyond the pale in, in our day and time? Believers were priding themselves as being uh, closer to God than other believers, a step up on the spiritual ladder than those around them. Is there any of that going on? There, there's competition, folks, um, within assemblies and between assemblies, and that competition is going on as I speak. The bent towards serving self, seeing self in a better light than seeing others, uh, doesn't decrease as the centuries go by and time passes on. Um, the bar is just simply lowered as we go. As we move forward, the bar is continually lowered. And what we saw as being abnormal behavior in days past, we now see as being perfectly normal. And I would say proper, being taught that these things are proper uh, as time marches on. So as we continue our look at, at some of the issues that Paul had to deal with in that carnal Corinthian assembly, keep in mind uh, that the group there consisted of Pharisaical Jews. These were Jews who had been born under the law contract but had yet to believe that Jesus was the Christ. Along with, and these were, might say this, they were very religiously minded Jews who had come to believe Paul's gospel. Along with Gentiles who had never been under the law of Moses in the first place. They, they had no part of the law of Moses. Only the Jews had that. So we're looking at issues where Paul's teachings were intended to make an impact on both groups. Pharisaical, religiously minded Jews that had been unbelievers and Gentiles. But let's begin with a quick review of some of the problem areas that Paul had to address when it came to the carnal Corinthians. Understand that we're not trying to do a verse-by-verse -verse exposition at this point of either of the two letters, but we'll be covering some of the major prominent issues that Paul addresses in Corinthians uh, that have caused confusion in the minds of believers even in our day. Uh, pride had led to divisions, factions within the church, as I just mentioned, so right at the outset of his letter, Paul reminded them of their oneness in Christ. He reminded them of who they were, their relationship with Christ being joined to him at the point of their belief, but their relationship with Jesus Christ made them equally joined to one another. This is why we're called the body of Christ, and it's both a term that describes our oneness with Christ and our oneness with one another as believers. So Paul reminded them of that right at the outset. Paul always began in a positive manner. I don't know if you've noticed, but in every epistle he writes, he commends. Somehow he finds something good to say about the group he's addressing. And then he gets down to the meat of the matter. He gets down and where the rubber meets the road and starts telling them what they need to be doing and not doing that 
that, that uh, he thinks he needs to address. He always began with reminding the saints of their positional, as I like to call it, standing in Christ. You're one with Christ. Um, before he began to, to lower the boom, as I said, when it came to the believer's behavior, uh, he wanted them to see how God was viewing them uh, in light of their, their union with his son. And, and he had to start there from that spiritual standpoint in order that they might begin thinking on a different level when it came to the way they were viewing and conducting themselves in regard to one another. So he's telling them how God's viewing them, hoping that they'll see if God's viewing you this way, why can you not look through those same uh, spectacles when you're viewing those around you? Attitude always precedes action. So if these saints were to begin conducting themselves in a manner more consistent with who God had already made them to be in Christ, that altered conduct would have to be motivated by the love that Christ had displayed toward them um, and the fact that they were now joined to him. No other motivation would work. If law motivation would work to get people to line up and, and, and live and properly conduct themselves, as Paul said we ought to, then the law would have worked. But how many are justified according to law-keeping? None. So the law wasn't given that they would see sinning. The law was given to Israel so that sin would abound. Uh, Paul said. That's a different thing than we'd normally think. We think he gave them a law as a way to make them good, and we'd better get back to the law. But the reality is he gave them a law that he knew they couldn't keep before he gave it to them. So that they would, that law would become their schoolmaster and teach them, you need to cast yourselves upon who I am. You need to quit putting confidence in that flesh of yours. You're a sinful creation. You've got a sinful nature, and you're always bent on serving self rather than serving the other person. Not only were those Carnal saints in Corinth, one in Christ, having been baptized into Christ at the point of their belief in what Christ accomplished at Calvary where their sins are concerned, their spiritual union with Christ meant that they were equally joined in the very same spiritual union with fellow believers. Uh, whether they liked them or whether they disliked them, that union was still in place. And it extended to every believer in every assembly from Jerusalem outward. It... Uh, it, 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 it encompassed, I might say, every saint in every location when that body of Christ was formed. Yet these saints in Corinth were acting like that union didn't exist. Um, some have called it love doctrine here. He, Paul opens this letter with what, what uh, rightly can be called body truth. Some have called it love doctrine, and rightfully so. Let's jump ahead to chapter 6 where Paul brings conduct into the picture. And we'll begin with verse 7. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you. What would that tend to do, the pride nature, right off? Uh, can you see walls beginning to form? But Paul's the apostle of grace, and he's, he's put it out there for them to see. There's utterly a fault among you because you go to law with one another. They couldn't deny that. They knew they were, there were lawsuits taking place. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Now, that's an interesting statement. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Where do we stand when it comes to those things? How quickly are we uh, ready to jump on board and take wrong and be defrauded and let the other guy off the hook? Um, Continuing on in verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Now this verse causes a lot of people a lot of problems. Let's look at it. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What do you have to be to, be to inherit the kingdom of God? You have to be righteous. How righteous do you have to be? Perfectly righteous. You have to be as righteous as God himself because his justice won't take anything less. How can you be as righteous as God himself in the court of God's justice? You have to be joined to his son so that the righteousness belonging to his son now is credited to your account. It's a gift decree of righteousness. That's what justification means. Be not deceived, Paul continues, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, boy, does that cause a lot of problems in a lot of folks' minds. A lot of folks stop reading right there. They don't continue. They stop reading right there, and without reading further, they wrongly assume that it's the above-mentioned sin list, the above-mentioned behaviors that are going to send people to hell. Will there be people in hell who have committed one or more of the above law infractions that Paul's just listed for us? Absolutely there will. Uh, of course there will. However, 
Hell will be equally inhabited by people who haven't committed a single infraction on the sin listing Paul's just given us. So, did you notice Paul didn't mention liars? And that's one of the things God detests according to Scripture. And there's no mention whatsoever of murderers in his listing. Why did he leave those things out? Do you, do you suppose that Paul was given the Corinth, giving the Corinthian saints an everything but list in verses 9 and 10? In other words, was the apostle suggesting that these are the only sins for which a person will be sentenced to hell? Or if you do one of these things, too late, too bad, down you go, rather than up. Uh, and that people with lesser sins may very well be excused from suffering that same fate. Use your heads now. Put on your thinking caps. The answer to that question is no. Paul's not giving them an everything but list. This is not Paul's everything but list at all. He wasn't saying be careful not to commit these particular transgressions or hell will be your fate. Then why, we might ask, did Paul include this particular listing of sins when addressing the carnal saints at Corinth? Why not some other listing? Uh, the reason Paul mentioned these particular sins is easy to figure out. These were the very sins that characterized the lives of at least some in the Corinthian assembly. Um, we know that to be the case because Paul tells us it was so in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Let's take a quick look. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Now stop here for a moment. Paul's telling us that fornication, described as any illicit sexual behavior in the dictionary of the Greek language, including pornography, was not a hidden practice to those within or without that assembly. Uh, it was common knowledge, according, it's commonly reported that this is taking place among you. So uh, if it was reported commonly, everybody knew it was taking place at Corinth, didn't they? Uh, in other words, everyone knew the things that were going on among the carnal Corinthian saints, even if they weren't there present in that assembly. But now in the remainder verse, Paul reveals the level to which the carnal behavior had risen. And such fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles. In other words, even the Gentiles understood the wickedness of the behavior of at least some within uh, that Corinthian assembly. And they avoided it, that one should have his father's wife. It's interesting also how some try to lessen the seriousness of the, seriousness of the offense Paul brings to light in this passage by saying it wasn't this carnal saint's actual mother that was involved in the sin. It was most likely his stepmother that had been a willing participant. Um, that makes things better. <laughs> um, well, what difference does it really make? What would the formerly pharisaical Jewish believers in that assembly at Corinth, those who had been born into that law contract, what would they have known about the law's prohibition to the practice of fornication under that law contract. Um, two statements in the book of De Deuteronomy sum it up quite nicely, quite explicitly. They are Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 30, and Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 20. Let's take a quick look. A man shall not take his father's wife. Does it say mother there or just a wife of the father? Shall not take his father's wife nor discover um, um, his father's skirt, uh, nor discover from a primitive Greek root word meaning to denude his father's skirt. Uh, Deuteronomy 27, 20. Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife because he uncovereth his father's skirt. And all the people shall say, so be it. Amen. The language may be different then than it is now. It may be different now than it was then um, than what we would use today, but the point's just as clear. Uncovering a father's skirt had to do with being a participant in unclothing, an unclothing of the woman for sexual purposes that had belonged to the father. It's just a simple thing to figure out. According to the law contract, it made no difference whether it was a mother or a stepmother. It was unlawful to uncover the skirt of a woman that had belonged or was belonging to one's father. Uh, the words a father's wife would include a mother or stepmother when we really think about it. The same held true when it came to uncovering the skirt of a woman belonging to a neighbor or to any other man for that instance, if you want to look at the law contract. The Jews in the Corinthian assembly would have known the law's prohibitions against such behavior. And apart from their position in Christ, those behaviors would have proven the unrighteousness of man. And in order to make heaven, you have to have righteousness. And that righteousness has to be of a nature that surpasses any of these things. Um, but the Jews would have known quite well what the law said about what they were guilty of doing. Yet the former Pharisaical Jews in the Corinthian assembly were well, they were well aware of this behavior and they were well aware that it was being practiced within the assembly of which they were a part. It was common knowledge as Paul just told us. Uh, but wait, 
someone might say. <laughs> uh, I thought the law had been nailed to the cross of Christ. Truth is, it had. How much of it? All of it. In Paul's very first letter, his letter to the saints in Galatia, where faith was the issue, you recall that Paul made this very familiar statement in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Read it with me. We've read it earlier. Let's read it again. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of or belonging to Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be declared righteous by the faith belonging to Christ, his faith, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Paul went on to add this statement in verse 21 of the very same chapter. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by law keeping, by performance, then Christ is dead for no reason at all. God could have sent down a book, said, here are the rules. Here's the law, folks. Live up to these, these, law, these laws, and when the last person dies, the one with most points makes heaven. Uh, but he didn't do that. The law had to be nailed to the cross. Christ had to die because the law could not be fulfilled by anyone but Jesus Christ. A warning not to revert to rule keeping for righteousness is one of the first things Paul taught after teaching the gospel of Christ. Uh, that's what his very first letter was all about. Jesus Christ is the one who had, had borne the punishment, not just the sins. Christ bore the punishment for the sins of the entire world when he died for those sins at Calvary. Uh, bearing that punishment himself. If anyone should have appreciated the cross work of Jesus Christ and the fact that he had come to take away all sins by the sacrifice of himself, which would have included their sins, it should have been those carnal saints at Corinth. They should have really appreciated that. Paul had already taught them how, the word how is in there, hoti in the Greek, the full essence of how Christ died for their sins according to the scriptures. Christ had borne their sins upon himself and that he was buried, putting those sins away forevermore. And, and that proved the satisfaction of God the, the Father where the judgment for those sins were concerned when Christ rose again from the dead. Then why had these saints, especially the Jewish saints in Corinth, those Pharisaical saints, become comfortable with that which was being practiced in their assembly? Can you hear them arguing their case before the Apostle Paul? I can. Uh, we're no longer under the law, Paul. That law's been done away. When it comes to our righteous standing before God, we're now under grace. So don't talk to us about our behavior any longer. Uh, these are your very word, own words, Paul. That's what they would have said to him. You've taught us these things. You've taught us how the economy of the law has given way to the economy or dispensation of grace. So don't talk to us about our, our behavior, about our conduct. Well, Paul had indeed taught them these things, had he not? Certainly he had. He taught them about the grace of God and how the law and grace were complete opposites. It's either law or it's grace. It's either grace or it's law. The two have nothing to do with one another. Paul had taught them about their liberty in Christ. Uh, just as he had taught the saints in Galatia about their liberty from the law when it came to their righteous standing before the Lord. He told the saints in Galatia to stand fast in what? In their liberty, in the liberty they had in Christ. Here it is in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 a verse very familiar to us at this point in our studies. Stand fast, therefore. Don't be moved away from, from what you have. Stand fast, therefore, in the important word, liberty, wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And Peter called that yoke of bondage the law contract that neither the twelve nor anyone in Israel was ever able to uphold faithfully and consistently. That yoke of bondage Paul was talking about was the law of Moses. This is why Peter at that Jerusalem council called the law yoke of bondage that no Jew had been able to bear. Put simply, Paul was saying, don't go back to the law as the basis by which to gauge your righteous standing before the Lord. Uh, while these things were equally important for Paul's uh, Jewish, con or for the Gentile converts to understand, you can see how important it would have been for those who had been formerly Pharisaical Jews to come to understand. Um, liberty was a concept totally foreign to their thinking when they held that liberty up against the law that confined everything they did. It's easy to see how the Jews in the Corinthian assembly might have had the tendency to move toward one extreme or the other. They'd go back to the law or they'd go to liberty. Um, some, as, a, as had been the case in Galatia, would have had the tendency to slide back to the law contract as the basis by which to gauge their relationship with the Lord. Others, rejoicing in their liberty, might have had the tendency to move in the opposite direction, 
uh, to use the truth of grace to vindicate behavior that's unbefitting believers. Uh, with the law as the governor of their behavior, would Paul say, allow the law to be that which governs your behavior? Wrong. Wrong. The law was never able to govern a person's behavior to the point that a uh, person would cease to sin. Uh, how much liberty did the Jewish believers have prior to the change from a law economy to the grace economy? The answer is they had none. They had no liberty. The law governed every aspect of their lives. The law spelled out some very strict requirements that were imposed upon that Jewish nation. And the law left no, what we might call, wiggle room <laughs> for those folks to do as they wanted to do uh, when it came to those requirements. For instance, the law told the Israelites what they could eat and how they could dress. Uh, it told them who they could marry and when they could work. It told them how they were to worship God and also how much they were to give um, to the assembly. It told them how they should deal with one another. Uh, it, it required the honoring of feast days, or we might call, Sabbath, might call them Sabbath days. Some 613 precepts controlled every aspect of the lives of the Jewish people under that law contract. This is why people, uh, Peter called the law a yoke of bondage that no Israelite had ever been able to bear. Uh, however, when the law ceased to become the basis by which God was dealing with the people of the Jewish nation, and when his grace economy was, was brought into play with all people alike, Jews and Gentiles alike, some refused to relinquish the idea that God was dealing with them on the basis of their adherence to the law contract. They still thought God was dealing with them on that basis. Uh, is it not the same today? And does that not still hold true with religiously minded Gentiles who had never been placed under the law of Moses in the first place? Um, many profess to believe the gospel. Saved by grace and grace alone when it comes to their salvation. They say they were saved by grace and grace alone, but then they suppose that God is dealing with them on a day-to-day -day basis according to their adherence to rules and regulations, whatever they may be, and each person has his own. And then we judge others. We play assistant Holy Spirit, and we judge others according to how they measure up to our short list or our long list, whatever the case may be. And we might use the Ten Commandments. It could be whatever set of rules and regulations that we've latched onto um, by looking at the law of Moses in order to remain in good stead with God. And it's done today. Um, some would say we must observe a Jewish Sabbath today. And that would be when? Sunday? Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. Or God would have nothing to do with this. They would go as far as to call the people that worship on Sunday the Antichrist. Others believe that unless a person is baptized under the auspices of a particular denomination of persuasion, that person isn't saved at all. That's a particular denomination. And then with others, it's simply a matter of degree. Degree. They would say, you don't have to be water baptized in order to be saved, but God will honor you in a special way if you submit to water baptism. Um, if, of course, that baptism is performed by a pastor of their own denominational persuasion. Paul was letting the saints in Galatia know, folks, along with the saints in Corinth, with his letter to those folks, that allowing the law to be the governor of a person's liberty is to move away from the reality of grace. Um, one of the results of making the law the governor of a person's liberty uh, in Christ is what is called relative righteousness. That's where the idea of relative righteousness comes from. As long as my observance of my rules and regulations is on a higher plane than your rule keeping, at least in my mind, God will favor me over you. Um, I call this the cubbyhole system of righteousness. You've probably heard me talk about it in, in lessons past. We've got different cubbies for all types of sins, if you think about it. Um, if I consider your sin to, more, to be a more egregious sin than my sins, then I'm up here and you're down here when it comes to being in good stead with God, at least in my mind. After all, you do the eights, nines, and tens. And I only do the one, twos, and threes. That's the idea of relative righteousness. As we gauge everybody else's behavior based on what we think is right and wrong. And where do we get that? A lot of times from the Ten Commandments or from, from Israel's law program. When it comes to the entire relative righteousness idea, whether a person likes to admit it or not, the law is the governor, has become the governor of that person's liberty and that person's mind. Or there would, be no such, there would be no such thing as relative righteousness. And as that person will see it, the law has become the governor of the liberty taken by others as well. Are you with me so far? This is why the religiously minded folks are the first to judge others according to the yardstick they themselves are using as the measure of their own performance-based righteousness. 
Um, to allow the law to be the governor of our liberty in Christ can only lead to the opposite end of that law governed liberty spectrum. I'm sure you know what it's called. It's called license. So you hear it called like, well, you've got a license to sin. If you believe in grace, you've got a license to sin. Guess what? We were born with it. <laughs> we were born with it because we all inherited that sin nature, that bent towards serving self from Grandpappy Adam. Think about that for a moment. The idea of a license to sin would not exist, could not exist, if folks weren't using the law as the governor of their liberty and the governor of the liberty of others. To suggest that grace gives a person a license to sin is to say that the opposite of grace, which is what? Law is the agent that helps restrain people from sinning. Um, apart from the law's restraining influence, people would just go out and sin all they want is the idea a lot of folks hold in their minds. Uh, tell me, did God place Israel under the law in order that the law might re uh, restrain the people from Israel from sinning? Think it. Think about it. Let Paul give you the answer to that question, and he does so. Here it is in Romans chapter 5 and the first half of verse 20. Moreover, the law entered, God put the law into effect for Israel that the offense might abate or abound. Lesson or increase? God put the law in, uh, in place for Israel that the offense might increase. Wow. That's just the opposite of what most people think, is it not? Uh, so if I say that grace will cause sin to increase and that the law will cause sin to decrease, I'm allowing the law to be the governor of my liberty whether I believe that to be the case or not. Paul would have us know the law should never be that which governs our liberty. Never, ever, not once. Allowing law to be the governor of a person's liberty in Christ takes on many forms, and, and some are not so obvious. For instance, and we talked about this in another lesson, there's that form of allowing rule-keeping to be the governor of a person's liberty that's used within the hallways of religion, and it's often disguised as something else. It's most often dressed in the cloak of the word encouragement. Have you heard it? encouragement uh, why if we want to live right be on that 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 plane of righteous living we've got to form a group an accountability group and we've got to be accountable to the other people and everyone being accountable to one another and this is going to help us all live better lives uh, how about that idea of accounting groups are uh, you often hear them called encouragement groups um, accountability groups. We've talked about it in an earlier session. The idea with accountability groups, as I said, is that they will help people to remain in line and not go out of the bounds, behavior-wise, in other words, to be better behaved believers. If those people agree to be accountable to others of like-minded faith who can encourage them to keep that line maintained. Uh, there are women's accountability groups, men's accountability groups. Accountability groups have become a fashionable exercise in the world of religion and mainline religious churches across the land. But tell me, to whom is every believer accountable? Uh, to whom? Only to God. Only to God. To make myself accountable to a group, to any group for that matter, with the thinking that my group accountability is what it will take to keep me on the straight and narrow path, behavior-wise is nothing more than a reversion to the idea of rule-keeping being the governor of my liberty. The focus remains my conduct and the conduct uh, condoned by the group. And the necessity of, of using one another as the restrictive influence to keep the behavior of every member of that group properly aligned. Uh, it's rule keeping for righteousness, folks. It's just disguised. If God's law did not work as a sufficient restrictive influence on the behavior to decrease the sinning of the Israelites who were accountable to God to keep that law, what would make anyone believe that a group of eyes to whom I've now made myself accountable will accomplish what the law could not? Uh, do we now exchange the oversight rule of the law for the oversight of an accountability group, supposing the group's oversight will produce different results? Um, that's what accountability is all about. If we follow the teachings of the Apostle Paul, we will never allow the law to be the governor of our liberty. Nor will we allow group speak to become the governor of our liberty either. God didn't design it to work that way. Each individual is accountable only to God and only for his own life, no one else's. Now, we talked about these things, as I said, in earlier sessions. So a couple of questions remain. Question number one is this. How much liberty, when it comes to conduct, how much liberty does a believer really have when it comes to being bound to obey the law's requirements 
where that person standing before God is concerned. How much liberty do we have? Should the law not have some controlling influence over a believer's life? That's a good question, is it not? It needs to be answered. Question number two, did God design anything to be the governor of a believer's liberty? The answers to both those questions become obvious as we listen to our apostle. First of all, did the apostle Paul allow the law to be the governor of his liberty in any respect? Did he use the law of Moses when it came to that which he allowed in his own life? Paul gave the same answer to that question four different times within just two verses in his first letter to the carnal saints in Corinth. You realize that? And you're, you know the passage. The first is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, and then Paul repeats himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. These folks were taking great liberty. So Paul tells them, it's not about law keeping. I'm not, I'm not putting the law on you folks to govern your liberty. Let's put both passages together. Here they are. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful unto me. Whoa, Paul. You didn't say some things, most things, certain things. All things are lawful unto me. No, nothing's illegal. But all things are not expedient or advantageous. We might say beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any of those things. He says it again, repeats the same thing in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things don't edify me. All things won't build me up and won't build you up. Well, it was not the law of Moses. If that was not what Paul used, he was, he was free from that totally. What was it that constrained the, the liberty that the apostle Paul had in Christ? Was it a group to which Paul became accountable? No. <laughs> Paul tells us in his second letter to the carnal saints in Corinthians. Here it is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ, not our love for him, his love for us constraineth us. Because we th ju thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. If God had displayed his love on behalf of the carnal saints at Corinth by bearing their sins and the punishment for those sins upon himself at Calvary, bearing that punishment necessary to satisfy the Father's justice where those sins were concerned, and the carnal saints in Corinth had known that to be true, then should they not be able to display the love that Christ had displayed toward them, toward one another? You see, law gave place to love. If the law doesn't govern a person's liberty, what should be the governor of our liberty? That word called agape, that word called love. This is what Paul was talking about in his letter to the Galatians in chapter 5, verse 13, and chapter 6, verse 10, where he made these statements. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty... Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Galatians 6.10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. That would have been Jews and Gentiles alike in Paul's day. It is in ours. It wasn't, as some have suggested, that Paul was saying, if you commit these particular sins, you're going to hell where you'll be paying for those sins forevermore. That's not what Paul's case was. That's a faulty interpretation. Hell will be filled with sinners of every ilk. We can be sure of that. But the inhabitants in hell will not be paying for the sins that Christ successfully paid for at Calvary. They'll be in hell. Hell will be filled with sinners who've refused to believe that Christ died for their sins, that he was buried, putting all those sins away forever before they drew a breath, and that he rose again from the dead because God the Father was fully satisfied with the payment made by his only begotten Son. It was the love of Christ that made it possible for the law to be nailed to the cross of Christ in the first place. And it's that very love that's now to be the constrainer of the liberty every believer has in Christ. It's nothing at all to do with the law. Love is to be the constrainer of the believer's liberty. As simple as that. This is what Paul was telling the carnal saints in the passage we just read uh, in Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ, in other words, his love toward us, constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all then we're all dead including me including you Paul's two letters to the carnal saints at Corinth are filled with information pertaining to the lack of love that these fleshly oriented saints were displaying toward one another they were characterized by a lack of love 
The Corinthian letters are letters about love, the love these saints were failing to demonstrate when it came to one another. So look again at the three things that the Apostle Paul said remain as major doctrinal issues for believers in this economy of grace as is, that's now underway. They are faith, love, and hope, Paul told us. A mo uh, move away from faith and into legalism was the issue in Galatia. The very first thing God the Father knew and God the Holy Spirit knew that Paul would be facing and the first thing he wanted, doctrinal issue he wanted Paul to lay down uh, as revealed in that first letter. A, a reminder concerning the believer's hope in the return of our Savior who will be bringing all those who have died in faith back with him at his second coming along with the fact that no believer will be the recipient of the wrath of the returning Christ. The wrath he'll be pouring out on a Christ rejecting world at that time. That was the issue in Paul's next two letters, his epistles to the saints of Thessalonica. So obviously those are hope doctrine. What Paul say remains? Faith, love, and hope. And uh, Faith, hope, and love actually. And here you have faith first, hope second. A lack of agape love was the issue Paul was addressing in his two letters to the carnal saints of Corinth who were focused on serving the lust of their flesh, lust of their eyes, the pride of life rather than that which was in the best interest of others. So looking at Paul's letters quickly in the order in which he wrote them is a clear demonstration of the three things that Paul said remain today along with the order in which God intended those doctrinal issues to be set forth. Galatians, faith. First and second Thessalonians, hope. First and second Corinthians, love. It shouldn't surprise us that these are the three issues that Paul talked about when addressing the saints in Thessalonica. In his first letter to those saints, Paul commended them with this statement in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your, next three words, work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. So as we... As we look back at Paul's letter to the saints in Corinth, we find the apostle revealing some principles and exercising liberty in a responsible manner. Uh, should a believer place limits on his liberty in Christ? And understand, I'm talking about self-imposed limits. Should every believer place some limits on his liberty in Christ? Paul's going to say absolutely. I think it's a good question. Paul's going to say absolutely. What is a believer's responsibility knowing that he's been given total liberty? from rule keeping for righteousness? These are the questions I want to deal with uh, for the next few minutes here in the balance of today's lessons. Since, since we're, we're looking at the issues Paul faced in Corinth while on his third apostolic journey, we need to know that those issues stem from the fact that the believers in Corinth refused to place limits on their liberty. In other words, they failed to act responsibly given the liberty they were, had already been given in the light of the cross of Christ and the entrance of the new dispensation. How should we conduct ourselves? Since Christ took the sin issue off the table of God's justice at Calvary where he suffered the, suffered, suffered the penalty for those sins, how should we be conducting ourselves? In the first three verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul compares knowledge with love. He's going to take the principle of knowledge and he's going to hold it up alongside the principle of love so that we can see what they look like. Then he's going to show us knowledge without love and how, what that does and what that would lead us to conclude. Finally, he'll show us how knowledge plus love can lead the believer to responsible beha behavior in the light of total liberty. Let's begin with verse 1 of chapter 8 where knowledge and love are compared. Here it is. Now as touching things offered unto idols, Paul wrote, we know that we all have knowledge. If you were living at the time when Paul wrote this statement, you would immediately know what he was talking about. The Israelites, under the law contract, were they were required to bring sacrifices to the temple. And these sacrifices consisted of various meats, grains, and drinks. And just as the Israelites brought their sacrifices to God in what could be called true worship, the heathen, or Gentiles, participated in a similar fashion by bringing the same type of sacrifices to their false gods, to their idols. Some of the meat was for the use of the priesthood. We know that. Some of it was burned up in sacrifice, and some of it went back to the one offering the sacrifice for the use of his own family. Uh, so you can imagine the amount of meat, both Jews bringing it to the temple and Gentiles to their, to their idol worship. You can imagine the amount of meat that would result from these sacrifices being offered continually in pagan worship alone. There was plenty of meat left over. 
Well, what do you do with so much excess meat? Especially since these would have, they would have been some of the choicest cuts. Remember, they would have to be, choose the meat without spot or blemish. Uh, their true worship was to be, to be brought that way. To handle this, and also make, it a profit, make a profit on the side, follow the money trail, the pagan priest utilized two outlets. Uh, some of the meat would be taken to what the Bible calls the shambles. Who knows what the shambles are? Open door meat markets were the shambles. So some of the meat would be taken to the shambles, the open door meat markets to be sold to the public. Now if you wanted a choice cut of meat, and you wanted to save a little money in the process, what would today's advertisers say? Quality at a price you can afford. <laughs> Where would you go? Would well, the best place to go uh, would have been to the shambles, the outdoor marketplace, because you could get both there, quality and a good price. The meat could be sold at a discount because it had already been offered to the idols. Now, if you were a believer, would you have a problem if you were a believer in Paul's day, saving a little money, buying your meat at the shambles? Probably not. Many did not. You could throw a barbecue. Think about it. You can invite twice the number of people to your barbecue at half of the cost. <laughs> well, some didn't think anything at all of that. They had no problem with it at all. After all, are we not free in Christ? Or do we not enjoy total liberty in Christ? Absolutely. We're under grace. We're not under law. But others took a different approach in Paul's day. Uh, they knew Paul's attitude toward idolatry. Paul detested idolatry, as did God. In fact, Paul tells believers to flee idolatry. Keep in mind that Paul had spent 18 months with this same group of carnal saints, and some were confused about what to do with meat that had already been sacrificed to idols. In their minds, it would be wrong to eat meat that had just been offered to a false god. They felt like they would be participating in the sinful practices of these pagans, and they didn't want to be guilty by association, they might say. So here was another division in the church. One group thought it was perfectly right to eat this discounted meat. There was nothing wrong with it. And the other group said, no, we shouldn't eat meat sacrificed to idols. That would identify us with heathen worship. And Paul begins to answer that question. To settle it, they put the question to Paul. So he has to answer it, and he does so in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning with verse 1, with these words, now is touching things offered unto idols. So the remainder of Paul's answer is interesting, both for what it does say and also what it, for what it doesn't say. I want to move back over to the book of Acts for a moment. We'll look at a similar situation, very similar situation, that occurred several years earlier than this episode here at Corinth. This incident is recorded in Acts chapter 15. This is generally known as the Jerusalem Council. We've talked about it, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. To let you know what was taking place there, the Apostle Paul had come to Jerusalem once again as a reminder to meet with the other apostles. The question that the apostles were considering concerned the relationship of Gentile believers under Paul's ministry, a ministry to those not under law, with the Jews who were practicing in accordance with the law of Moses. The Jerusalem Council was held to discuss Paul's ministry. Now notice the comment made by James. In Acts chapter 15, verse 19, James, by the way, that speaks in his epistle about the perfect law of liberty. So let's look in Acts chapter 15, verses 19 and 20. Wherefore my sentence, James said, is this, that we trouble not those Gentiles, uh, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols. Wouldn't this directly cover what we're talking about here in Paul's letter to the Corinthians? And from fornication and from things strangled, and from blood. In other words, James was agreeing that the Gentiles were not under the law of Moses. James was saying, we don't need to trouble the Gentiles with the law of Moses. They were never under it. But on the other hand, James didn't want to offend the Jews who were still being faithful to the legal requirements of the law. Their consciences were bound to it. So James concluded the matter beginning with verse 28. Notice how he did so. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols. Whoa, does that not cover what we're talking about here? And from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. Not that it's a law for you folks, you Gentiles are never under that. From which if ye keep yourselves, you'll do well. Fare you well. <laughs> So James is saying these things would be good for you. They're not your rules and regulations given to you from God, but it would be good for you if you do these things. Interesting thing, as Paul replied to the Corinthians while on that third journey, is that he didn't say 
This issue was settled a few years ago at the Jerusalem Council, guys. Abide by the decision that was made there. He doesn't say that at all. He doesn't say abstain from meats that have been sacrificed to idols. Mm -mm. And I believe one main reason why he didn't point back to the decision at the council was because Paul was demonstrating his own apostolic authority to the Gentile saints, to the Gentile believers. These were people in Corinth who, or there were people in Corinth, I should say, who doubted Paul's apostolic authority. They didn't consider Paul an authentic apostle because he wasn't a part of the Twelve, and they were correct in that view. He was not a part of the Twelve. Uh, he was a new apostle sent with a message concerning the new dispensation that had been ushered in, and he had been sent to remake all men aware of that. But what does Paul say? What he, what he, what he does say is also significant. Uh, let's consider that for just a moment. Paul continued his answer to those saints in the last half of chapter 8, verse 1. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Now, watch Paul compare knowledge with love as he continues his thought. Knowledge does what? Puffeth up. But charity, agape love, builds up. First, Paul mentions knowledge. What does Paul have to say about knowledge in relation to dealing with other people? He says knowledge puffs up, meaning meaning that knowledge fuels man's ego. Um, that's what knowledge alone will do. If you take knowledge all by itself and you add to it the human ego, the result is often an inflated ego. Um, wow, I know something you don't know. <laughs> uh, that's what knowledge does by itself. Knowledge by itself puffs up because the one having the knowledge has a tendency to place those lacking what he knows in an inferior position. Um, this is why gossip is such a popular pastime, if you think about it. Uh, listen to what I know that I bet you hadn't heard yet. <laughs> um, ever feel compelled to tell someone some juicy bit of news before someone else beats you to the punch? Um, knowledge by itself puffeth up. On the other hand, what does agape love do? Paul says love edifies. In other words, love builds up the one who is the object of that love. On the one hand, knowledge puffs you up, but on the other hand, love builds the other person up. The real issue here is whether we are interested in ourself or whether we're interested in the other person. Want to take the test? <laughs> Paul gives it in verses 2 and 3. The first part of the test is your view of yourself. Let's look. We see it in verse 2. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. Woo! <laughs> Ooh, I stepped on my toe. Um, if you think you have all the answers, the Apostle Paul considers that to be knowledge without love. In other words, beware the person who thinks he knows it all. Uh, the person, that person has a lot to learn, according to Paul. The first test of true knowledge is the attitude the person has towards himself uh, who, suppo uh, who supposes he has that knowledge. If a person thinks he, he's the final authority, get your truth here, the truth sold here, nowhere else, that he has all the answers, there isn't anything left for that person to learn. That person knows nothing yet as he ought to know, according to Paul. He's not so smart after all. We're all learning and we're all learning all the time. And to prove that, try to have held on to something you've held as true in your mind for a number of years. Then someone comes along and offers you some a little bit different take. How anxious are we to discard what we had held as truth? to adopt real truth. Happens all the time, folks, and it happens to all of us. Second test of knowledge, operating in a correct manner, is found in verse 3. And that's the attitude of the person toward God. Let's take a quick look. But if any man love God, the same, that man's known of God. The second part of the test is your love for God, your love for the Lord. Now, we all say we have love for the Lord, we love the Lord. In other words, a truly knowledgeable person would rather be known by God than to be known by men. That's where it is. The first principle Paul's leaving us with, this, with us is this. In matters of Christian liberty, love must accompany knowledge if a person desires to use his liberty responsibly. Love must accompany your knowledge. Now, Paul's going to take this principle and he's going to show us what will happen if we base everything on knowledge alone without the love. In verses 4 through 5, we find knowledge without love. What does a knowledgeable believer know about meat offered to idols. Here it is in verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. We know that. 
For though there be those that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, some people worship heavenly gods, some earthly gods, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Paul's agreeing here that this person has knowledge. We know that there are no other gods. The idols aren't true gods. The Greeks were polytheistic. They believed in many gods. But their consciences were bothering them. And according to Paul, they were the ones with the weak consciences. Their consciences had to be reprogrammed. But what did Paul tell them, adding love to his knowledge? If that offends their conscience, I'll not eat meat as long as I live. So is it, is it important, more important to be right more important to hit people with what we know that they don't know and what they should know that we, know, we now know. Is that more important than we be right? Or should our knowledge be accompanied with love? And should we limit our liberty based on that person's conscience? Paul did. But what caused him to do that? His love for the other individual. His love for the other individual. So law gave way to love. And now love should be the constrainer of our liberty in Christ for every individual. It's our love for what he did for us that we can now express to the other individual because we're free. You know, everybody wants three things in life. What do we want? Unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, unconditional forgiveness. So where do we go? A spouse. Can any spouse give you unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, and unconditional forgiveness? Impossible. Impossible. Uh, you can let your imagination run wild, and I can tell you there'll, there'll come a time when that spouse say, will say sayonara. Uh, but the reality is you've already got it. God has already given you unconditional love. He died for you while you were yet an unbeliever, while you were yet an enemy, the Bible says. He took your sins off of you while you were yet an enemy. He paid the price for those sins. He died, and because the Father was satisfied, He rose again the third day. He loved you while you were yet an enemy. Wow, what motivation that should give us to to have a behavior different when it comes to the love we express for other people. The law will never work as the governor of any person's liberty, but love will work in that manner. And that's what Paul's getting at here in Corinthians as love was the issue in the Corinthian letter. So we'll leave it there. We'll come back next week and we'll look at some other issues.